Some good news. Lightsaber edition. Let's get right to it. I don't have a second camera angle. Hey, welcome back to Live in the Shop. Hope uh, to entertain a little bit. It occurred to me too that these Live in the Shop videos might be um, really kind of chronicling my descent into madness. Well, we'll just wait and see. See how it goes. Um, so yeah, some good news. Great stuff you got going on there, John Krasinski. Krasinski? Krasinski. Yeah, that's right. It's a wicked smack. Never been to Boston. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for tuning in. Those of you who know how this works, there's a little chat box in the bottom right of your screen. If you're on a computer, you can just type in some comments, questions, and I'm going to do my best to engage and interact, grab a coffee or a beverage, and uh, yeah, let's get right into it. Um, I was thinking about stuff this week, and I was having this conversation with my beautiful wife, who you met a couple episodes ago, about storytelling in Star Wars. Um, love my work. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Um, storytelling. And there's just something about... We, we were watching Picard. I don't know if you've seen Picard on the sci-fi or whatever. Um, there's something that really stuck out to me that I thought they did really well with Picard that they failed to do with the more recent Star Wars films. Um, the story of Picard wove into the storytelling whether it be flashbacks or reminiscing um, memories of what had happened. So you've got this leap in time from Next Generation to Picard. And I know this isn't Star Wars, but bear with me. Uh, Next Generation to Picard and all the time that had passed in between, well, they filled in a lot of what had happened as not to set the stage per se, but as the story evolved, they kept adding in pieces and building this complete picture of key events that led up to the current timeline. Now, that I really find that rewarding in a story when they e explore kind of how we got here and where we're at. And that's something I felt was missing in the uh, the, the sequel films. And I gotta say, I, I was kind of afraid of that being that J.J. Abrams was in charge. I'm not gonna badmouth J.J. Abrams, but while I was cautiously optimistic, I was reluctant because I don't know if you've seen the TV show Lost that he started. I don't know how much he had to do with Lost. Um, but I bailed after somewhere in the second season when I realized that the title Lost described the writers, not the subject of the show. They weren't filling in any details. They weren't any answering any detailed questions. They weren't. They were giving backstory to the characters, but they weren't providing detail and as a as a I, I want a story that kind of gives me detail and explains things and I felt that was missing in the the, uh, the sequel films but it was really present and really beautiful in Picard um, another thing that uh, that I really noticed I've been reading I Jedi by Michael Stackpole again as you might have known given the the cornhorn stuff by the way I posted a whole bunch of stuff on the website today, pictures of the speeder uh, design, some of the sabers that'll be available for sale on May the 4th, and then how the May, May the 4th Be With You sale is going to go on Monday. Um, so, side note, been reading uh, Michael Stackpole, I Jedi. Hey, hello from Japan. Welcome. I wish I had some cool Japanese saying to, I got nothing, sorry. Um, but you are welcome here. Um, yeah, Reading I Jedi by Michael Stackpole, and his writing is brilliant in that he just adds in and fills in detail. And even the, if you won, or read the X-Wing series, I'm trying to read questions as I go here. Um, if you've ever uh, read the X-Wing series, there's these beautiful reveals. And the thing about a reveal in a story is when it happens, I want to have all these details that were unanswered leading up to it go, click into place. Um, the master of this, of course, the ultimate, was the, the KOTOR, Knights of the Old Republic reveal. When that happened, it was mind-blowing, and your mind was racing, replaying conversations, going, wait a minute, and you're seeing how it clicked, 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 and you never even knew the reality until it was revealed. But of course it made sense. Michael Stackpole's writing, there's a reveal, something happens, and you're like, oh, of course this makes sense. Now, fast forward to the Star Wars sequel films, a big reveal, and we go, what? How did that, I don't see how it, 
gives the impression that they're making stuff up as they go, which was my problem with Lost. They're making stuff up as they go. I don't know if that's the case with the sequel films, but I wish they had done it differently and put the work in so that when there's a big reveal, it's just like, it's masterful and it just clicks back all these things. And when you rewatch it, all the, all the scenes leading up to the big reveal, you're going like, oh yeah, I could see hints of it there. I could see how that makes sense in it. You know, just didn't. anyways, I wanted to get that out. Anyways, I'm getting a lot of hellos. Uh, there was a question there about scratch build lightsabers. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to ask that again because I missed it. Um, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Feel free to fight me on this idea of storytelling in Star Wars. Um, I just, I just, every time my son, uh, one of my son's birthdays recently, and we watched um, The Rise of Skywalker, or sorry, The, the Last Jedi. And I was watching for, you know, having seen now Rise of Skywalker, some of those clicks. And do you ever get an itch to find scrap parts or a hardware store to use to reconnect with your roots? Um, not so much in sabers. The, qu the question was, as some of you may know, having looked at my Mad Cow shop secrets, um, I got my start playing with lightsabers by just using found parts and hardware store junk, um, much as the old school prop makers did. Um, now, of course, we use CNC mach machine parts and high-end electronics. Um, the question was, do I ever want to get back to my roots in that? Not so much in, in regards to sabers. Sabers has become kind of a refined art that I want to really... I really want to execute well with the best tools and supplies that I can. Um, but with a lot of the other prop stuff that I do, I really love getting into finding junk parts, finding things in the recycle bin um, at local stores uh, or things that I think, well, that would be really cool. I'm not sure for what, but the imagery, the, the texture, the, the shapes I really like. So I'll, I'll hang on to it. I'm, I've got a, a catalog, a, a library of, of kind of found parts that I want to, I want to use. Um, will there be an option for OLED on May the 4th Sabres? No, uh, OLED is not going to be an option on regular Sabres. It's only going to be on my Sabres for, for special stuff. Down the road, it may be an option, but not currently. Um, so anyways, back to the original question. Yeah, I want to I use junk and found parts. I actually have a project coming up that I'm probably going to challenge Brian from the Smuggles Room, if you're watching, um, I'm gonna. I'm, you you started this with a whole Star Warsify some common thing. Uh, I've got something that I'm gonna take. I'm gonna figure out how to Star Warsify it. And once I've got an idea, hey, he's actually Brian's actually watching. What are the chances of that? Don't you have things better to do with all the projects? You have no time. How can you watch this? Maybe you're watching while you're working on something really cool. But anyways, my my thought is I want to build something. I want to Star Warsify something. I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet because I need time to think about how I'm gonna do it. Uh, otherwise, Brian's going to blow me out of the water with what he's able to do on a short notice. Um, so I need to kind of put some thought into it. I also want to throw this out soon, when the time's right, to Adam Savage and Bill Duran and some of the big dogs out there with props and, and make a fun project of it, challenge each other to Star Warsify a, a thing. I think Brian had a great idea there. Uh, anyways, uh, so back to these questions. Saber specifically being so odd, I missed that. Um, when you ask a question, oh good, Brian's on board. Excellent, excellent Smithers. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Um, when you ask a question, try to make it short because the speed at which I read and the speed at which these things stay on my screen are at a different level and I'm not fast enough. When will Vector Savers be on st in stock again? Soon. Uh, the reason Vector and Ascent Sabers are not in stock right now is simply that I'm waiting for batteries. Uh, I've got enough batteries to do the May the 4th sale Sabers. And uh, so when the batteries come in, I want to make sure, given the changes in supply lines with the COVID thing, that I'm able to get them. I don't want to take orders and then, you know, three months later, sorry, I can't ship your order yet. I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I don't do that. So when I have the batteries, then I'll put them back in stock. So they're going to be soon. Uh, the Sabre specifically being sold for May the 4th, will there be no a no OLED option? Interesting question. Uh, I will explain to you. This, here's one of the Sabres. It's a good question. Uh, no. So loud. You can see the OLED screen firing away, doing its thing. Actually, you don't even need to turn the Sabre on for that. Just tap it and you've got battery level and all these little cool animations. Where's the crystal? There it is. Rotating crystal. Um, if you don't like the OLED screen or you don't want that, Here's a simple trick with this saber that you probably can't do on other OLED sabers. Undo the pommel, 
rotate the chassis. No, we'll rotate this way. Oh, no OLED. Oh, look at that, where'd it go? Rotate it back in. Oh, there it is. You gotta line it up. So if you don't want it showing, you can just rotate it out. Of course, you can go into the programming and switch it off, make it do different things. Um, so for these sabers, it's kind of like the special thing. Um, so, uh, so if I understood your question right, I know these sabers, uh, they're ready to ship. They're as they are. So the two sabers that I have with an OLED screen will ship with an OLED screen. I don't know if that little twisty trick is what you had in mind for a simple way to mute it, shut it off temporarily. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of questions that are, are coming in and I really appreciate you guys participating with me because it makes it fun. Will you be producing new sound font soon? Best spin here on Spitfire, some of my all-time faves. Thank you, thank you. Um, Brian's asking, what's the lead time I'm getting on your sabers? I'll get to that in a second. Uh, sound fonts, as I've addressed a couple of times as people ask, I produce them as inspiration hits. When I have an idea, I think, oh, that would be really cool. I'll work on it. Sometimes uh, I have to put things aside and, and blast it out in like three days of solid working on it in order to get it done. Um, uh, other times I'll have an idea and I'll just let it, you know, go back to it every few weeks until I have something that I can present. So all that to say, I don't produce sound fonts on a regular basis. They come and go in batches. The only one that I'm really working on right now is the, um, the TIE Fighter uh, sound font that I'm going to be working on. I hope to have something to show soon, but I'm still not done on that. And I don't have anything else on the books right now except to maybe update a couple of the old ones. Um, Brian's question is about, uh, about lead time for the savers. Generally, with my production series savers, uh, when they're in stock, that means I'm able to build your order and ship it out within eight weeks. That's what it means. If I'm not able to do that, I'll pull it. It won't be in stock, either because I've got too many orders or I'm waiting for parts. Um, so there's things like the Bad Axe, which I know a lot of people are, uh, are looking for, and there's only going to be the one available on May the 4th. Um, I am virtually out of stock. I have to keep a little bit of stock back in order to fulfill custom work list orders as I get to them. Um, so the next time I'm going to have a batch of Bad Axe Sabres was going to be hopefully this fall. But uh, with the COVID thing, things are getting pushed back. I don't know if I'm going to be able to put those back in stock this fall. We'll have to just see. Uh, Creed is another one uh, I want to get back in stock this year. I'm working on that as well. Um, as you know, I'm... I'm the only guy working here, so I gotta space things out and time things so that I can balance my workload. Um, have you shopped out any recent purchases from the last few months? Have you shipped out? Uh, if I understand your question correctly, yeah, I, I've basically shipped out every order that's come in, save I think two that are waiting for some things. So, uh, why are your saver fronts so inexpensive? Um, I simply haven't raised the price like some others have. Uh, I know some of the thinking is, there's what, 40 some sounds that goes into a, a Crystal Focus sound font. Um, so the thinking is, well, if I, if I double up and if I add 80 sounds and have all these different options and I can charge more, I generally don't do that. I have my saver fonts, I work on them till I'm really happy with them and then I present them as they are with not a whole lot of options necessarily. Um, I'm a purist. Uh, so I just haven't, uh, boosted the prices, I I feel like there's a kind of, there's a balancing act, as you may know in economics. You price it too high, you won't sell as much. Uh, you price it too low, you'll sell lots, but you won't make any money. So there's a sweet spot in there. And for Saber Fonts, I've decided that $7 is my sweet spot for now. Hope that answers your question. Thanks for that. Um, let's see what else we got. I missed a bunch there too. Nobody seems to want to argue with me about my story telling insight so obviously they're not controversial enough will you be accepting commissions for custom speeder sabers i don't know i um sorry reading other questions i i'm going to see how this goes if all 10 spots get snapped up on may the 4th that will tell me hey people like this design and i will proceed with trying to get more in i may periodically because i've got enough parts to do a couple of custom versions i may do some variations and play with it um, you know, with different colors, different looks, different things. So we'll see. Uh, you think we do UCS Elite version of the Speeder Saber. Um, I've messed around with modifications to try to put crystals and things like that in, um, in a production series Saber design like the Speeder or Ascender Creed. 
I have something, but not at a point where I'm ready to present it yet. So it's one of those long developing things. I may eventually get to a point where there's a crystal reveal and things like that, but really it, it for what it is, it's not, it's not on the, you know, on the fast track to try to get that done. So, uh, so a GCS elite version of a speeder saber, probably not this year, maybe something like that next year. Who knows? Maybe for May the 4th, I'll have a, a crystal reveal one with the actual crystal, three crystals that Cornhorn used and it'd be cool. Uh, something greatest Star Wars movie ever made. Again, too long. I love the speeder saber. Thank you. Uh, reminder again, if you ask a question, try to... Have you ever considered making a production saber along the lines of your desert dragon saber? Um, not really, because with some of those special one-of-a-kind sabers, a couple of reasons. Um, I, I advertise them as a one-of-a-kind. So if then a year later I've all of a sudden announced a line of identical sabers, and the guy who ever bought it was like, hey, I thought I had something special here. What are you doing? So I don't want to do that. The other thing is, a lot of what makes a saber like that special is the etching. And I'm not going to do, um, you know, etching on a, on a production series saber. Um, so just the shape, I might have a saber come out that has, has influences of it, um, you know, but probably not a production series saber. And that points out another thing too. You may notice if you followed me, I'm not r rushing out a saber, a new saber design every year. Um, I take my time with these things. I want them to be, I want them to be something I'm super proud of. And often that takes a couple of years of just playing with ideas to get something that I'm. So I think it's been like two to three. Every two to three years, I've been announce, announcing a new design. Um, you know that may change. We'll, we'll see. Um, Brian asked a uh, long question from Denmark. You'll have to shorten that because I don't have time to read it all. Uh, Brian asked thoughts on Rogue One and Solo. Um, for those of you that follow me, you may know. I was cautiously optimistic about the sequels, a little disappointed. Uh, Rogue One was excellent. I loved a number of things about it. Um, I loved uh, how it really didn't mess with my precious expanded universe. It really kind of fit. Uh, it fit really well. It felt like Star Wars. And one of the reasons it felt like Star Wars is the intricacy and the beauty of the prop design, the set design, and particularly the computer interfaces. If you if you go back and watch it again, Blind was one of the companies in, uh, that did some of the computer interfaces, but the prop work was so beautiful in that it, they had a challenge. They needed to make this a film that was in the same era of A New Hope, but yet they needed to make the most believable props they could. And so they used A New Hope imagery for the, the Rebels, the Imperial, uh, you know, it's computers and interfaces and, and wall junction boxes and things like that. And they made them new and they made them fresh and made them so beautiful that it just drew you into the story. One of the things I loved about Rogue One. Um, but in my opinion, Solo is the best film of the Disney Star Wars era, hands down. Um, and primarily the reason for that is my favorite Star Wars character is the Falcon. And Solo, among other things, is the story of the Falcon. And when L3 dies and, and L3, spoiler alert, uh, L3's consciousness and, and abilities are, trans, are, are, are uh, incorporated in the Falcon's computer, it was just this, like I was talking about earlier, an epic reveal of all of a sudden L3's navigational capabilities in the Falcon, the Falcon's computer is glitchy, and you hear the echo of C-3PO in Empire Strikes Back saying, I don't know where your ship learned to communicate. It has the most peculiar dialect. That's where! That's how that happened! It was like, yes! They had a reveal that clicked back in time, and, it, you know, not back in time movie-wise, but back in time in terms of viewership. And so uh, I just, I love Solo. Um, I love other, other things, too. Hit Han shot first. I don't know if you picked that up. Uh, will you sell pre-wired profi boards? No, nope. uh, I get this question periodically. I only sell sabers with Plector Labs technology because I have a relationship with Plector Labs. I love them so much. I love their stuff. I'm sticking with that. I'm not going to try to become an expert in somebody else's boards as long as I got Plector stuff. Um, and I don't sell parts, so I don't sell pre-wired boards or parts. I sell only completed stuff. There's a couple of really good questions there that I missed. Something about custom etching. Um, I'm happy to reveal to you some of what I do for etching, but there's a lot of little tips and tricks that I just keep to myself. Uh, do you have other designs uh, on cur curved tilts? Curved tilts are tricky because they need to, in my mind, they need to work. A curved tilt that looks good, then you pick it up and go, oh, I don't even know how I would use this, is to me useless. 
I, I want you to be able to pick up a curb tilt that I built, like the Bane or the Bad Axe, and go, oh, yeah, I can totally see how you use this. It just feels right. And, um, so I don't have plans for another curb tilt at this point. Um, they are tricky, um, but who knows? We'll see. Lots of great questions that I'm missing. These are good. Am I talking too fast? Sometimes when I watch these things back, I feel like I'm talking too fast. Wow, a whole bunch of questions. I missed most of them. More install videos like you did for TCSS. Um, compressor blade plugs. <laughs> Somebody remembers the compressor blade plugs. Uh, I'll, you know what? You go harass Tim at Custom Saver Shop because that was a project that I kind of pitched to him and it's a back burner thing when they get around to it because they're so busy. So if he ever gets around to it, it'll be a Custom Saver Shop thing, but who knows? Um, uh, there was another question there. I don't know what it was, but uh, are Custom Savers getting too sophisticated? No. I'm just going to say no. I don't know, maybe to some, but uh, often I feel overwhelmed with the possibilities of what you can do with the electronics, and it's hard to keep up. I feel like, um, you know, I heard talk to a doctor once, and, and they said that, um, uh, you know, it used to be you could keep, keep up to speed on medical journals and the latest thing pretty easily, but now there's absolutely no way. You could spend all your time reading medical journals and the latest ideas and things and, and techniques, and you'd never stay up to speed. I almost feel like we're there with sabers, but... Uh, blade plugs. Yeah, uh, if you go to my website, there's, I think it's in the web store where you see the products. There's a link to my Shapeway store where you can buy my different blade plug designs and things like that. And you can paint them. You do a great Seth Rogen impression. Wow. I don't even know. I'm just kind of picturing myself as Blob from Monsters vs. Aliens. I, I never thought about it, but thank you. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the beard or the unpredictable nature of my discourse. Do you ever record your build? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, because I'm alone. And so as you know, Brian, as you know, building something and then filming said build multiplies the time and energy involved by a bazillion, which is an actual number. You can look it up. Um, no, I, I periodically, if someone asks this, will I do more uh, instructional videos? I'd like to. Um, but I need to find bite-sized things that I can kind of handle because some of these instruction videos were meant to be 20 minutes and end up being an hour and a half, you know, or split into two videos. Um, so it's just, it's a challenge. And right now I'm pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, longer. Uh, what's your personal head cannon saber color? Um, I'll show you. So for me, if I was a Jedi, I would go with what I call kind of like an ice blue or an aqua. So I don't know if it comes across on Canada, can, or camera. That's kind of an ice blue. This is, looks a little bit more green, but what I'm seeing is kind of like a, like a prequel, a new hope blue. Like that scene in the Falcon where he's kind of fending off, you know, the training remote blaster bolts. That would be my, my saber color if I was a Jedi. Uh, how is that commission list coming along? I don't want to talk about it. Uh, the last last year was going to be my year to, year to catch up on custom work jobs. Uh, didn't happen. So Crystal Focus 10 came out. Everything changed. Um, so this year is my year to get onto the custom list. COVID. It just, I, I'm blessed to have a lot of people wanting me to build them a custom saver, a custom version of my production series savers. Um, but really, I'm just honestly telling people it's a one to two year wait on the list. Now that may change as I go through the list and ask people and they're no longer interested and it you know, moves through the list more quickly. Um, but really, I'm only able to build one every couple of months right now. Um, I'd like to do one a, one a month as my goal this year. Uh, sorry for, I missed the sound font question and I missed the next question too. What two savers are still being worked on that you're having parts waited for? Uh, if, if I understand your question right, it refers to something I mentioned earlier where the ascend and the vector uh, will be in stock as soon as I get batteries in. And uh, so that will happen. Any Legends characters you still want to design the saber for? That's an excellent question. Um, I, you know, as I read through, I'm going to do more videos on your shop walls. Um, as I read through the Expanded Universe again, and I, I really enjoy it, there isn't really a saber or a character that really jumps out to me that hasn't already been addressed lots. Uh, if I get an idea and something clicks, uh, if you're an artist, you may know that sometimes you have ideas that are just ideas. They're not tied to anything. And then you have characters or stories that really grab you. And, and then every once in a while, 
that happens. And you're like, that would go perfectly with that character. Something clicks. If that, if and when that happens, I may do another expanding universe design. Um, again, there was another question there that I missed. Oh, shop prop wall stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a, a video of this little console, which is kind of work in progress. Any SoundCloud creators that you like besides the ones from saberfont.com? I don't really know any. Um, I'm gonna do a video of this console. I mean, eventually this is gonna be a whole unit with a, this is just built on a table right now, but it's gonna be a whole desk with cover panels and, and all that stuff eventually. Um, so at the point where I finish putting in some lights in that end and then weathering it, I'll do a video showing kind of what I did. Do you ever wanna design a saber for a non-Star non Wars character? <laughs> Picard lightsaber. Uh, crossovers aren't really my thing. Now, having said that, I've got Nord Steel etching pattern from Skyrim. Um, generally, crossovers aren't my thing, but every once in a while, I, so no, probably not a non-Star Wars lightsaber, unless I invent a character. Uh, do you use a synthesizer when making your sound ones? No, not really. I don't use a synthesizer. I use an editing program, and I basically use a combination of freely available Star Wars sounds that were released, I think, back in 1991 for people to do their own fan films and video games. Um, and uh, I do some movie captures, which I modify so that it doesn't infringe on copyright. And I do some Foley, which means uh, I make sounds, I bang things together, record it, and then morph it. Um, you know, sometimes I take a sound in, from uh, a ship, like in the Corrin Horn, or the Corellian sound font, there's a TIE fighter uh, firing that I've blended into several of the ignitions. So if you don't know it's there, you wouldn't hear it, but something about it, just because Cornhorn was a fighter pilot and he flew up in, in the story, a tri-fighter, which was a, uh, an ugly modification of a TIE fighter. So anyways, there's, there's reasons behind things that I do. Always a reason. Um, not necessarily a good reason. But, uh, so no, I don't use a synthesizer and, and craft sounds that way digitally. Uh, next UCS Elite Saber auction? I don't know when I get to build one. What would you say to someone who wants to start a commission-based business? That is an excellent question because, as some of you know, when I started doing this uh, as a hobby 20-some years ago, there was, I could count on one hand the people that were doing it around the world and trying to make money at it. And really, it was just a, a hobby to kind of help pay for parts for the stuff that I wanted to make for myself. Uh, fast forward to 10 years ago, when I went full-time into doing this, the reason I could go full-time is because I had at over 10 years of experience and reputation uh, and search engine optimization. When you Google lightsaber, often I would come up because I was one of the people that had been doing it the longest. Um, and so that gave me a, a clientele and a, a market that I could address with custom work. And then the bottom line is if people are paying me to do it and are happy with my work, I keep doing it. Um, so I was, I felt kind of like over time set up for that opportunity in 2010 when I went full time. Um, a lot of people starting out now, and there are a lot of people starting out now, factor that in. Um, you really need to build a reputation. You need to earn uh, respect and the trust of the community. There is a Sabre community. It's huge now. Um, but you really need to kind of get on the radar of everyone by doing great work, charge bottom line prices for it until you earn a reputation, and then you can start paying yourself back. Most businesses, if you start up a business, uh, most business expert, experts will tell you don't, you don't make any money for the first two years. So you need to kind of plan for that. Um, and if that helps you, but will you consider making a saber staff, non-detachable, exarcoon style? Ah, I remember looking through an, a Lucas Notes book and seeing the imagery of exarcoon's staff. Saber was very shorter and had prongs. In kind of a sketch. I don't know if it was a Lucas sketch or one of his concept artists, but um, no, to answer your question, I don't have plans for doing that generally other than kind of mall. I don't generally like the, the two, the dual wielding thing. I may play with an idea down the road. I had thought about doing a saber that used a single sound card because Crystal Focus is so versatile. Uh, using a single sound card and then uh, instead of having Cross blades that operate separately, independently, you have a whole separate blade of a staff saber. But any new customizations you'd like to do on a send? Oh, always. Yeah, I'm always thinking of stuff. Have you ever met George Lucas? No. I, I know a guy, Robert Bailey, a friend of mine, artist, who met Lucas and did some Lucas approved art, which was really cool for him, but no. No, I would love to meet George Lucas. I'd love to meet Ben Burt. I did meet Mads Mickelson. 
uh, before Rogue One, uh, I was at the Edmonton Expo. Shout out to any comic expo people from Edmonton. Um, and it was on Sunday, last day of the show at that time. And he was a guest there. And he went walking through almost an empty room. And I yelled to him, Mr. Mickelson. And he came over, shook my hand. We chatted for a bit. It was awesome. Turns out he was later on in Rogue One. Do you reach out, reach out to customers to go through? Oh, I missed that. <laughs> what do you think is buried on Oak Island? Ah, Oak Island! Ah. Let's go have a beer at the Mug and Anchor, and we'll talk all about the, the curse, or as my wife and I call it, cursing Oak Island, because our, our eye muscles are exercised by eye rolling whenever it's like, a Templar cross? Could this be? Oh, bro. Uh, that poor announcer, whoever's writing for him needs to get fired. Um, what I think is buried on Oak Island, I don't, I don't know yet. There's something going on there. Though. Uh, do you reach out, reach out to customers if you go into overtime with their order? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, generally, I like to, here's a business practice for you. Um, I got this from Scotty on Star Trek, is uh, you under-promise and over-deliver. So if I'm doing a project, I'll say, I can, I can deliver this in eight weeks. I'm thinking, I can probably do this in five. You're leaving yourself some margin in case there's a hiccup. Uh, if it's blowing past the eight weeks because of something, I'll always communicate. Communication is key. Communication is key. Um, always communicate. Here's what's going on. Here's why. Um, you know, people generally have a lot of patience if you're communicating. Um, that answers your question. These have been great. We've already blowing past. <laughs> Brian, do you watch Cursing Oak Island? Do you really? Uh, you're like my brother from another mother. Do you ever get tired of decline to make custom? Oh, I couldn't finish that. Designs you feel. Uh, custom designs overdone. I will take a moment and address that because uh, a few years ago, I hit a wall where my design sketchbook, I was designing savers and I didn't like any of them. And I'm like, what's the deal? Am I just dry? Am I out of ideas? Um, what I realized was at the time, this was years ago, I was designing savers with my limitations in mind. So I had a box. And I was designing in this box of what I could do, what I couldn't do, and I was keeping within the margins. Uh, and I didn't like anything I was coming up with. So I made, it, I made a decision. I was going to try to design stuff that I could never build in a million years. And all of a sudden, I started loving my work again. I was like drawing things. I was inspired. And lo and behold, some of them challenged me to learn new skills, to expand my box, to find ways to bring that design to life because I loved it so much. Um, and that's a secret I've tried to keep true to uh, all these years later. I try to design with the doors off, the sky's the limit, and then uh, if I find something I really like, I try to work with it. And sometimes I have to get help. Sometimes I need to learn new skills. Um, so there's my advice for design work out there. So again, there's a bunch of questions that I missed. I'm trying to think of anything else that I wanted to, to mention. I mentioned the shape waste thing. I mentioned all my beefs with storytelling. Um, would you consider making a sound font from TV shows? Dark Saber. Uh, that's a good question. Sometimes I've been rewatching we Rebels. Webbles. I'm Billy Quimke. We watching Webbles. Are you rewatching Webbles with me? I have been rewatching Rebels, and uh, I love the show. I love the art of the show. I love how they you kind of went back to Ralph McQuarrie art, um, and the sounds of some of the sabers are really impressive. Uh, I don't like the helicopter sabers that the Inquisitors use, but I find their sounds interesting. I find the distinction between Ezra Saber sounds. I, I don't like Ezra Saber, uh, but I like the sounds. So all I have to say, I don't know. Uh, proud owner of the Bad Axe Corinthian Cane. Yes, I remember you. First person, I think, to ask me to fit a saber specifically to be used as an orth orthropedic, orthropodic, forgive my terminology, a cane for someone that needs it to walk. Um, yeah. How do you feel about 3D printed metal chassis? Uh, that's a great question. I am dying to actually try one, but they're expensive, and I, so I haven't pulled the trigger. I've got a couple little parts that I've wondered, like the chassis that I used in the Bane Curve, that I wondered if I would like it produced in metal. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but I would like to. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, that's what it was. So I kind of softened the, the curves on a, a pommel of a bad axe saber, and uh, fit a heavier blade to it to size to use as a cane, and apparently works. Have you seen 
Ethan Zimmer's work. Uh, no, I know one of those sabers, somebody changed up the crystal because they thought it was plastic and they found out later that was actually quartz. <laughs> so maybe that's him, I don't know. Uh, do you ever consider making Darth Bane sound? Little known fact, 10 years ago when I was working on the Bane original, um, which I was entering in a contest on a forum that was in, uh, and it came second to The Killer Penny by, uh, by uh, Eric at Orbital Machining at the time. Um, I actually engineered my Korriban sound font with Bane in mind. If you know the stories, Bane actually trains on Korriban. Um, Korriban's his homeworld factored into several video games at the time, like uh, um, Jedi Academy, um, Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. Uh, so Korriban was my Bane go-to sound font. Um, so I didn't label it specifically for Bane because I also used some influences from the sounds I picked up on Dooku Saber uh, from uh, Attack of the Clones. So that's the kind of closest I have to a Bane sound font, per se. Um, but yeah, I did the Corellian, I did the Jaina, so I have done expanded universe sound fonts before. How many of your old sound fonts do you want to change to Smooth Swing? Pretty much all of them. The only exception is, and you'll hear it here, um, Heirloom sound font was one of my very first sound fonts, and I think it's crap. Um, my ability to attain what I was aiming for was limited. Now, my abilities have grown since then, and I'm able to generally attain what I'm aiming for. But that sound font, by the standards of the ones that I'm doing now, I don't like. So, I probably won't do an update on Heirloom. Um, but I think I still have to do Flourish. Uh, I did Jaina. I don't know how many more I have left to update to Smooth Swing. I'll have to check. I, I, in my mind, there was like two or three that I, I want to get to. So... Again, great questions. I'm actually surprised by how many people ask me questions about the sound fonts. So I really appreciate those of you that uh, that purchased my sound fonts for your Saber. I like them. Uh, it means a lot to me that you talk about them with other people and go, hey, this one's awesome or whatever. Uh, Kanan font, uh, I haven't yet. I don't know if you picked up, but Kanan's got a very purist sounding lightsaber, very traditional sounds, even the swings. They're almost like Dead Ringer for some of the ones from the movies. Um, any other old Sabers you want to remake? Not... Really, I don't think. Uh, the Bane and the Corrin Horn have been on my mind for several years of re kind of like re refreshing those designs and kind of feeling better about them. Uh, things I wanted to do, but there's anything on the top of my head. Um, Obi Wan Kenobi Episode 3 font. I did Fates, which was an Obi Wan Kenobi Episode 1 font, and I don't know that the sounds have changed all that much. Uh, I know Anakin's dead a little bit, uh, but them all. Thank you. Yeah, so, again, lots of great questions about sound fonts and stuff. Did you work in a machine shop or in electronics before you started the business? No. I am a hobbyist. Like many of you, uh, I tinkered on my weekends with stuff. And eventually people started trying to buy the stuff I was tinkering with and paying me to tinker on their work. And, and you know, I got opportunities. Um, so in the process, I learned some basic machining. I learned some basic electronics. My dad was an electrician, so I picked up some soldering things as a kid. I built models as a kid. Um, I took stuff apart to see how it worked. Um, I just had the demeanor of, uh, I, as an artist, trying to capture with a vision um, what what I wanted, how to, how to make it real. I have this idea, how do I make it real? What do I have to do? What work do I have to do? And when that happens and you feel inspired, um, you work ridiculous hours on things you think minutes have blown by because you're so captivated with what you're working on. Um, so that's driven me to learn new things. And of course, with the internet, you can learn almost anything. I could be a surgeon if I want to. I don't know if anybody would want me to operate on them. I probably wouldn't want to operate on anybody either. Um, funny story about that, but I'm not going to tell you right now. Um, any Mad Cow Shop secrets, tricks you'd like a video, make a video of? I, I don't know, probably. I have to... Sometimes it pops into my head like, hey, this would make a good video. Uh, but I've been so busy lately, I haven't been able to do it. Uh, I'll answer a couple more questions and we're going to wrap it up. Someone asked me my opinion on cross guards again. Uh, I'm not really a fan. I don't hate them. It's not like the concept of the Darksaber, which I loathe. I still don't like. I love the Mandalorian and I'm interested to see where they go with it. And I love how they've woven a really cool story around the Darksaber. I just don't like the idea of a black lightsaber. I just think it's, it's not a cool gimmick to me. Um... Crossguard, uh, Quillian's, Vents. Um, 
you know, I'm not opposed to them. I don't know if I'll eventually do one at some point. I just don't feel inspired to do one. Hobbyist translates to visionary. Sometimes, I hope so. Um, favorite production saver to work on? Good question. I think probably The Ascend. The Ascend to me has been the most versatile. I've had the most ideas and things I could try with it that I've been really happy with. Um, yeah. And you know what? Really, a lot of people don't realize this. The Ascend is based on an original that I built. It was one of the first savers I attempted when I got my 100-year-old lathe off a friend's farm and fixed it up. Uh, back in 2004. No. Yes, 2004. Yeah, so it's that old, the original design. I love it so much. Um, people are asking thoughts on NeoPixel and stuff like that. Uh, I've addressed that a little bit in some other videos. Maybe I'll get to the next one. But it's 40 minutes gone by, and we really need to wrap this up. Because I'm getting hungry. And there's probably something going on for dinner. I hear rumors of pizza. Um, I'm going to go see if I can help out with some of that. So uh, thanks again for all the questions. Thanks for being here with me and participating in this live thing. Um, and uh, if you want to rewatch or catch the beginning where I tried to impersonate John Krasinski, then uh, this usually they, they go up on, on YouTube um, within a couple of hours. Um, I'm going to uh, remind you one more time before I kind of sign off that I did update. A lot of people have been asking me with the details of May the 4th and how the sale is going to go down, what that's like. I've got uh, very few savers that are pretty high end like this one, which will be available on May the 4th. And you can go to my website and check out some information in the news section about how that's going to play out. And of course, the 10 spots on the uh, speeder. So uh, thanks for joining me again. I'll see you next week. Same time, same bat channel. And I am the only guy on the internet who's wearing pants. See ya.